Welcome to GP Strategies um, webinar series. Uh, this is the beginning of our thriving, not just surviving. Um, and today's discussion is on virtual training design and delivery. And it's about cultivating a virtual classroom. So I'll start with the agenda. We're very conscious of time today. So we want to make sure that um, we're respectful of the time that you guys have committed to us. We have scheduled this for one hour, and that is including a Q&A session. So Ben's going to kick off with, um, you're going to see this a lot, VILT. For those of you that aren't familiar, that uh, just refers to virtual instructor-led training. Uh, they can take various forms, as you'll see. So when you see that VILT acronym, um, we, we sometimes risk death by acronym, especially out in Singapore. We like our acronyms. Uh, VILT is virtual instructor-led training. So Ben will start with the key challenges and then talk about the design considerations that when you're running this type of session or you're thinking of converting some of your content from a classroom into a, a virtual session, um, you'll need to be thinking about these. And what tools do you have to do this? And then Ben will run you through a real life example. Uh, we're going to keep this relatively informal. It's going to be backwards and forwards. Plenty of opportunity to put your questions in. Don't hold them till the end. We do have a dedicated Q&A section, but do drop in those questions. We will get to them when we can uh, during the session um, as and when the flow permits. So first of all, let's talk about housekeeping. And I just want to say, Oliver, the reason why we're going to go into this housekeeping, normally with such a short time, we'd, we'd go a little bit quicker through this, but we want to run this like you should be running a virtual training. So we want to walk the talk. So let's jump into housekeeping, Oliver. Sorry, go ahead. Well, Ben, shall I, shall I let you take it as you would um, for a, a virtual session with these housekeeping slides? Okay, let's just jump into it then. So, so Oliver is based in Singapore. I'm based in Sydney, Australia. I look after GP Strategies uh, learning solutions. Um, I spend a lot of time, I think Samuel is still having audio issues, guys, if we could help to uh, help Samuel Istitoro uh, on that. Um, but I will continue. So um, so I, I spend a lot of time working with my team here in Asia, as well as our clients in trying to help them navigate uh, digital conversion. Um, and, and especially around digital strategy and modern learning transformation. Um, my other area, the other hat I wear is around leadership and employee engagement. So as you all know, leadership has traditionally been the domain for, uh, for, for classroom training. And, and so you know, by nature of the fact that my focus has been leadership engagement, I've spent the last five years looking at effective ways to make something that is traditionally classroom more effective digitally. Now with COVID-19 happening, um, we're getting quite a few people with sound issues. Can you guys hear me okay, Oliver? Loud and clear, Ben. We're, uh, the team's jumping on that in the background. Okay, um, if someone could respond to all of these participants and just say we're, we're connecting with you, okay? That would be great. Yeah. Just so I'll they know why, we, why they're waiting. Thank you. Um, because they can't hear me say that. So, so I spend a lot of time on that. And, and for me, you know, when this COVID-19 happened, and of course, it's, I hope everyone's safe, by the way, and sound and, and managing the, the situation well. I know different countries are having different responses. But of course, a big focus has been, how can we leverage training virtually? And so really, this series is really about it's really a public service announcement. This isn't about GP selling its services. This is really us kind of sitting there and saying, you know what, you can't just take training that you've been delivering in a classroom um, or in a face-to-face -face format and just lump that into a virtual environment and expect it to be successful. And so, you know, I'd ask the team, let's run a session, a series of sessions on some of the key things people will be doing today that you can take with you today to make some changes and implement now and into the future. So, so while virtual instructor-led training isn't the avenue for everything, um, you know, really sound digital design would involve a range of modalities, including virtual training. Um, so, so, so you know, I'm just seeing the messages coming and seeing some more audio issues coming through. Um, if we could just write a message to all participants telling everybody we will be working yeah, on it. Okay, I'm, I'm that great. Ben. I'm okay great. Um, so, so that's our focus here today is to really go through what are the 
just mindsets that required a couple of key tools that you should take with you when you're going and you're doing immediate urgent conversions so you can keep your organization connected and keep learning alive. These things will be true um, for now and into the future, but especially now. So first thing you would always start off with is housekeeping. Participants need to be aware of the tools of the trade. If people are not familiar with the tools, then it creates another barrier of engagement. So we always have some screenshots and you know, for example, this is how you connect to audio. Different versions of WebEx or Zoom or whatever platform you're using will have a different layout, so you'll have to adjust to that. Um, we have people with audio issues right now. We're managing that through our hosting, um, which is not me, I'm the presenter. We'll talk about the role of host a bit later on. We'll, we'll have you all muted, but sometimes for smaller sessions, you'll need to highlight to people exactly how and where they mute because people will lose that type of thing. So you highlight that to your participants. You'll also highlight where the chat is, little details such as making sure that the chat is to all panelists because you want, or if you want it to go to a specific person, but make sure you identify that with people because I promise you it will put the brakes on a session when someone is sending their questions to one person but the presenter isn't seeing it, it can be very confusing. So little details like that and also that the chat window, as you can see, and I'll just get my annotation tool going here, um, that little details like highlighting that maybe your chat is collapsed and that's why you can't see it. You know, people will often not find their chat window or their polling window um, because it's collapsed. So, you know, you'll highlight that. You'll also highlight different ways of interacting with each other. So to, in this session, I'll ask you to use some of these tools so you will find next to your participant profile or in the participants tab, in the participants tab, you will find some options for raising your hand for saying yes, I understand, for saying no, too fast, too slow. Depending on the version of WebEx, these tools will be in different locations. Some of them may not be available. And Zoom and others, you know, we don't really use Zoom that much because it's got a few limitations. It's got some great strengths as well. But you'll have to highlight these opportunities, uh, these interactions for the participants. The final one that we'll be using today is polling and annotations. So annotations will either be on the left-hand side of your screen via the squiggly line, or they might be at the top of your screen and look something like this. Um, and so you, I'll tell you when we're gonna use those in a moment. And polling, when we open a poll, you'll see that underneath the chat window, you may need to expand that if you've already collapsed it when we open the poll. And we will do a poll later on as well. So they're the tools of the trade for today. Um, you know, the main other tool we'll be using is the chat window and actually also this uh, ability to mark your mark something on the screen using your name and your arrow. So let's try, try that right now. I've got a world map. You guys are already very adventurous and already telling us where you are in the chat. Um, so if you could grab your pin and drop a pin on where you are in the world today, and I will drop my pin as well so I can be a team player. Maybe I needed a bigger world map. Yeah, I'm suddenly feeling that uh, we're seeing a lot of people from, from so India the pin, in China. Yeah, getting a question. The pin is located in your annotations. If you're on an iPad, you may, depending on which version, you may not even have annotations, um, but you can type on the screen, I suppose, as well. Yeah, the little dot of Singapore is difficult to find, but I'm assuming we've got a lot of people in Southeast Asia. I know we had someone in South Africa. We've got a couple of folks in Australia. We've got some folks in China, in Taiwan, in Japan. Okay, Samuel can hear us, that's a great victory. We've got someone just slapping a coat of paint somewhere around Tasmania, New Zealand, or just floating out somewhere in the Tasman Sea. Someone's uh, living the dream, a liverboard there. Yep, someone is on a yacht, yep, definitely. So yeah, so this is our first interaction and you do want to build in an interaction like this right at the beginning to get people to use the tools as soon as possible. Um, so guys, I'm going to stop that now and I'm going to change slides and I have the ability to clear everybody's pointers. And, and I tell you what, everyone will still want to do that. Um, so I'm going to clear these pointers and people will continue to drop pointers. That's how it is. And I'm also going to clear all annotations. I'm going to go to the next question. We've got Rashmi who's having audio troubles. If anyone could go and help Rashmi. Um, so I've got a question for you guys. 
I got a question. So this question is biggest challenges in going virtual. Specifically, we're talking about virtual training. So in the chat window, make sure you've responded to all participants. Tell us in no more than four words, what do you see as the biggest challenge to delivering successful virtual training? Um, biggest challenge, whatever that may be, go ahead. So bandwidth, technical issues like sound. <laughs> If everyone Not can help. Body language there, I think that's a great one. Um, yep. You can't read body language. We do encourage the use of video, but that can still be a challenge. Making it interactive. Yep. Engagement. Participants not being prepared as they, they come in. I think that's a, a really valid point. Um, engagement, interaction. Attention. Attention is a, a, a really good one. And actually, as somebody's uh, mentioning attention, I could admit I'm, I'm very impressed looking at um, our WebEx um, attention uh, metrics here that we actually have a lot of people who are not multitasking. They are focused on this session, so we appreciate yes. that. Yeah, I think that there's a balance of, of people able to consume the content. What content is the right fit for virtual as well? Getting the trainers the right skill set. And I'll tell you what, it's not just a skill set, it's a mindset as well. Yeah, nuances of body language. Um, and our internet connectivity is one that's coming up a lot. Um, yeah, so for me, I would summarize what I'm seeing here is familiarity, engagement, technology, familiarity, and connectivity. Um, and then, of course, content. You know, what do you actually put into virtual? And look, I know there's a whole bunch. I, I like keep them awake. You know, I think I'll try to use that language. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of challenges that to going virtual, and we're going to try to address these. Now, keep in mind, guys, we've only got a short window, so so don't expect me to solve world peace right now, but I will certainly try to address a few of them right now. So let's go in with this in mind, with these challenges, and I will frame the things that we talk about against the challenges that you guys have mentioned. And so Ben, just, just as we're, we're jumping into this, this is a reminder for people that this is uh, one in our series of webinars we'll be tackling. Um, uh, over the coming months to help you with uh, with digital and, and the new normal that we're, we're dealing with now. But also one of the things that we have offered is a 30 minute consulting call um, with any of you that are on the session that want to do a deeper dive into something specific based to your um, scenarios. So that is uh, something that we're offering. So as we go through this, if there are questions and pieces you get to the end and you go, but I really needed to know this, you know, do get in touch with us. We will be reaching out to you and um, there will be the opportunity to get um, yeah. either myself or Ben one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So sorry for that, Ben. Okay, so, and I'm just seeing another question come up around squeezing one day into four hours. So guys, look, let's jump into that now. Distractions, um, yeah, keeping them focused. So we're seeing a lot of similar things. So here are the, I guess, the key components of a VLT mindset. So this is gonna challenge some of your preconceptions and of, 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 of what's possible and what's not possible. So number one, it is a reduced duration as was highlighted. I noticed one day to four hours. I would say that the golden rule is not more than 90 minutes for a single VILT session. So that's rule number one is you should be working in blocks of ideally 60 minutes, um, but yeah, 90 minutes. And if you really need to stretch it two hours, like 120 minutes, you could probably manage it. But the reality is that people struggle People get fatigue, you know, in this environment. And you talk about attention, you talk about engagement. You know, you're going to need to make sure that you're keeping your sessions in 90 minutes. So straight away, as soon as I say there's a cap of 90 minutes, your mind's going, okay, what does that mean? Well, maybe that means I need to start packaging. Instead of going for one one day, maybe now I'm going to be doing three 90-minute sessions. Um, and, and there's more advanced versions of that as well. So VILT or virtual instructor-led training isn't the source for everything, you know, so maybe it's a blend of solutions, not just VLT. There's a lot of annotations going on. I don't know if we can kind of temporarily disable annotations, but that would be quite helpful for now. Um, so reduce course duration, that's number one in the mindset. You've got to be going in thinking, this is going to be only 90 minutes per session max. Uh, number two, you've got to rethink your content. So given that you've only got 90 minutes or, or, or you've got to chunk your content into smaller bites. It's not just, I'm going to take this that worked in a classroom and I'm going to drop that in a, in, in a virtual. It's not going to work like that. And, and also there's other reasons why you need to rethink your content as well, such as including 
interactions and leveraging the technology effectively. And we're going to touch on that in a moment. But the content requires a pretty big rethink. I think uh, Alok is having trouble seeing the slides. If we could try to help Alok, that would be great. Um, so, so we're going to deep dive into that content piece because not all content is a great fit for virtual instructor-led training, number one. And number two, you would never run a classroom training and stick that in a virtual and run it the same way. It will not be interactive. It will not fit in the time frame, and it will not um, you know, be a success. So, so try to completely rethink your content. Number two, too many distractions. So people have their emails, people have YouTube, people have you know, whatever distractions, their phones, who knows what else. So the golden rule of VILT or virtual instructor training is you need to build in an interaction every three to four minutes. Now look, this is like if you were a master level, you know, virtual instructor led designer and delivery, you would strive for this. I'm not saying that, you know, everyone can achieve that straight away because it does require some thinking. Um, and some experience to make that happen. But that is the golden rule, is an interaction. Actually, it's two minutes. I was very generous and gave you guys three to four minutes. Um, so, so an interaction every three to four minutes is critical. And if you think of that and then look backwards. So now I've got reduced course duration, 90 minutes. I've got to look at my content. All of a sudden, if I have to include an interaction every three to four minutes, I have to, that, that, that triggers me to rethink my content, right? So you're rethinking opportunities to, to engage, to ask a question where normally you may have told them something. You're looking for opportunities to, 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 to ask people their feedback in a way that isn't using their voice. So that's a totally different way of thinking. So interact every three to four minutes. Uh, the next one that we have is group size. Larger groups equals more reliance on technology. Smaller groups equals less reliance on technology. If you've got 10 people in a virtual instructor-led training, you can probably get away with just asking people questions and getting them to use their voice. Um, you know, but, but in larger groups, you just don't have that luxury. Like right now, we've got 174 participants. I can't unmute everybody because it's going to be a cacophony of noise and it's going to be really hard to manage. So if you feel like you need it to be intimate, then maybe you need to think about, I need smaller group sizes. I can't stick 50 people in, but if I do want to have 50, then I have to change the way that I interact. So it's all about that balance between interaction, what I need to achieve from a learning standpoint, and the group size. So the next one down is golden rule, right? Ask, in, ask and then show. So it's a kind of rule of facilitation is when can I ask instead of tell, but you really, really need to be thinking like this in when you're designing your content. You need to be thinking because that will create the interactions. Here I was going to tell them something. What can I do to turn this into an interaction? So instead of saying, hey guys, here are the top 10 challenges for virtual instructor-led training, I'm going to turn that into a chat question. I'm going to get people to write it down and I'm going to use that as an opportunity to interact. So when can I ask instead of tell? That's your mindset every two to three minutes or four minutes. Uh, the next piece that we've got here is choose your technology carefully, choose it wisely. So everyone's rushing into Zoom and there's a lot of advantages to Zoom um, and there's some issues with Zoom, right? So you need to first of all know from a design standpoint, what type of experience do my learners need to have? What type of interaction do, they need, do I need to have? And what is the learning outcomes? Once you have those questions answered, who are my learners? Where are they? What do they need to know? What does my business need? Then you decide on the technology. I highly recommend that you avoid saying, let's pick a technology and try to shoehorn our content into it. Sometimes you don't have a choice. That's a realistic uh, outcome. But I would actually end up saying, you may answer these questions and say, you know what, virtual is not the best solution for this. You may say, we need to do this through a social platform, or we need to do this um, through through face-to-face -face coaching, or we need to do this through um, a MOOC, right, an online MOOC or something like that. So choose your technology carefully. Once you have chosen it, know the tools very, very well and train it to your participants. Another key trick, a best practice, is run a session for 30 minutes just familiarizing people with the tools before you run your actual learning because it will wash away the lack of familiarity and you'll be able to hit the ground running. All right, let's go to our last couple of tools. Build the tech comfort. So you've seen us do that here. We give you the briefing and we get you to start using those tools right from the start. That's super important. So make sure you're building that in right at the beginning, not just teaching them, hey guys, here is this, here is that, 
but you're also getting them to activate those skills immediately because later when you want to use them, they've forgotten. Um, so that's another rule. And then the final one is hosting. You do not want to manage the platform and the delivery at the same time. So right now, if you look in the participants, I don't know if you can see it, I have two other hosts and a co-presenter. And the host's job is to get the send out the invites perhaps it's to add all the polls to the platform in advance it is to, uh, to deal with technical issues so i can focus on you guys and the learning and, and the hosts worry about all the technical aspects so best practices have a host um, hosts need training so we run tr i'm not trying to sell this but we run or maybe others run you know sessions to certify people on how to host in zoom how to host in webex how to host in teams you know so uh, so the reason why I'm bringing that up is not to sell it, but to say it's that important that we actually have a program that we run internally for our own people and for externally through COVID-19. Um, so that's been an increased demand. So these are some of the key mind things that you need to have in your mind when you're going into um, a virtual instructor-led session. It's shorter. You have to build in interactions every three to more four minutes, which means you have to rethink your content completely. Do not take what was in the classroom and just slap it into a virtual. It will be really boring and not engaging just because you can't do some things that you can do in a classroom in a virtual environment. Um, ask instead of tell. Choose your tech carefully. Think about what you want to teach first and who your learners are before you choose your tech. Um, then build the tech comfort in. In the start, I suggested that you run a briefing in advance and remember to have a host and train your host. You, if you're a great facilitator or presenter, you may not be great at tech. So you may not want to be the one who's an expert at setting up polls and running virtual breakouts. So keep that in mind. So I've just got some tools here that I wanted to kind of run you guys through with before we move into a little bit of an example and a bit of Q&A. And I, I imagine we might run over time the 30 minutes a little bit. So here are the tools of the trade you have for interaction. And your number one tool, your number one tool is planning and design. I think in a classroom environment, a good facilitator can come in with average content or, or you know, so-so design, instructional design, and make it work, right? And make it sing and make the content experience. But in a virtual environment, if it is not designed well, it will not run well. So design is your first port of call. So for example, how, when did I build in the poll? How did I build in this chat? How did I build in an interaction? Where did I get them to drop a pin on the screen? How did I do all of those things? They need to be designed in advance and the host needs to be aware of them. So when you run the session, everything's ready to go. So planning and design is your number one tool for having successful VILT sessions. Um, number two, you, right? Vary your tone and your pace and your approach. My tone and pace is right now fast, hard and fast um, because we've got a, a, a fairly uh, quick uh, speed. Um, um, so, okay, sorry. So I realized we had 60 minutes, so we do have time for Q&A, so that's great. Um, polls, capture your feedback and audience sentiment. So we can use that to assess people's knowledge. We can use that to... Um, to capture audience, how they're feeling about a topic or a theme, text chat, emojis and icons, chat and, uh, sorry, uh, Q&A and breakouts. So I'd like everyone now to drop a pin on, some, on, on an area that they feel like they'd like to go into more detail on. So grab your pin and pick an area that you think, Ben, could you give me some more examples or talk a little bit more about that? And we can do that. So grab your pins and we will try to respond. So lots of people have found the annotate function, which is good. Uh, we've got some pins, we've got some highlighting. Um, Ruth is asking, and so is Barbara, where the, the pins are. So when you're looking at the screen, there may be a, a, a tab, uh, a white tab on the left-hand side of the screen if you're uh, on a laptop or a desktop computer. And there you will see a squiggly line, and that is the annotation function. If you click on that, you'll have a selection of different annotate options. Um, and while you're, while you're there, the top one usually is the pin, and it'll drop a pin with your name and a color. You'll also have the ability to type text or use a highlighter um, or draw squiggly lines, as some of our folks have found. So we've got a bit of a spread here. You know, I think the majority of people are on the design 
side. Um, and then we've got some people, uh, uh, so the second biggest chunk would be in the breakouts. And and then it's a mix between all the others. So look, they're all interesting and we're not going to have time to address all of them. Let's start off a little bit with design. Um, and so I'm going to pause you guys there. So no need to drop any further annotations or drop any further pins. We're going to try to address as much of this as possible. And like I said, we can run an additional session if this is valuable to go into more detail in any one of these areas. So let's talk a little bit about design because everyone has to go through that channel. Not everybody has to use a poll, but everyone has to go through that channel. And then we can also talk a little bit about, you know, some of the other the text and chat features and polls. So so look, let's use it, do a little an, ex, an experiment or a case study. So I'm going to change screens here. So here are co four common scenarios that that you will deal with in a classroom environment. So you in a in a classroom you got to get the participants to introduce themselves. You have to introduce a new module or some new content. Um, you need to sometimes gauge how are people going, how, how what's the level of understanding in the room. You might need to, you know, when when you're doing feedback and debrief, you might need to fill in the gaps. You know, there's things that you do in a classroom environment and that and the question is, how do we kind of convert those to virtual? So let's pick one area. Like, how do we get things moving? How do we introduce a module? So what I've done here is I'm keeping this theme of, of virtual training. And I've got three different interactions that I might run. And we'll run one of them. But we're, we've got three different interactions that I might run depending on group size. All right, so, so I'm going to stop here. You guys don't need to drop any more pins. Everyone's super eager to drop pins, which I understand. So one example that I might use is in a small group. Let's say I've got 10 or 12 people. Um, thank you, Ruth. I can see you've got your annotations now. So you've got 10 or 12 people in the room, or maybe even 15 people. I'd say that's about the limit. Um, I might just say to kick off this session, right, because I need to have an interaction, right? So instead of just saying, hi, guys, welcome to the virtual training session. Um, you know, here's what we're going to talk about today. Why don't you go, uh, you know, let's jump in. I know I need to build in an interaction every two to three minutes. So I might just say, share with me your name and how you feel when I say virtual training, and I would unmute everybody one by one. I would only do that with a small group and if I had adequate time. You know, so, so this is obviously very similar to how I might run in a classroom training. But let's ramp up the group size. Now I've got 20, 30, 40, 50 people and or I have a short amount of time and I don't have time to let 10 or 15 people speak. <laughs> and now I might need to disable everyone's annotations, please. <laughs> this um, is the problem. You give people thing. the power, it's Ben. Cool and it's they, good, uh, yeah. It goes to their head. <laughs> so guys, this is hypothetical. You don't actually have to type in. So, so that's one way I might run it. But now I might ramp it up. What are the biggest challenges or considerations for VLT? And I might get people to use the text tool Right, which is in your annotations, and I'm going to write some text here. I'm going to say biggest challenge of design is finding the time. Sorry, that text is not in a good color. Um, or I might, you know, say the biggest challenge to design is linking with the technology. So this is how I might use the type on the screen function. Now this would only be for up to like 40 or 50 people because what happens? Type into your chat. What will happen if I have 150 people all typing on the screen at one time? Can anyone tell, type into the chat and tell me what might happen? Overlap, chaos, <laughs> yes. Chaos. Yep. They say in Chinese, the one chi buds out, which I think means it's all in chaos. Yeah, text yes. goes over the top of text. So there's a limit, right? I can do that for, for a few different groups, organized chaos, maybe disorganized chaos. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Now, another way I could do this is, OK, so now it's a bigger group. I'm worried about chaos. Now I might go in and I'm going to start using the chat. So now instead of getting you to type on the screen, which is what I did way back here, right? I was worried about chaos, so I created an opportunity to chat. Now remember, from a design, thank you very much for my Mandarin co uh, compliment. Um, so, <laughs> so basically, what we're seeing here is I've intentionally designed to capture challenges from you in a way that was manageable and in and in a time in a timely fashion by getting you guys to type in the chat. If it was a smaller group, I could have gone with one of these other messages. So I use chat 
may, in key moments when I need to capture feedback that's more than a word or just when I need to capture more than a sentiment, um, there are ways that you can actually get the words that are going in the chat and get it into a SoundCloud and all of that. That's really advanced. I'm not even going to bring that in there. Um, so, so this is another kind of way I would run this same interaction. So I've, another way is then polling. So now I might use this because the group is immense or that I've got such a limited amount of time, I, can't, I don't have time to capture so many different diverse responses. So here maybe I've got a team of trainers on or I just want to get a read on how comfortable everyone was in training. So instead of saying how many challenges, here I've said how many virtual training sessions have you delivered in the last six months? And what this will do, this will give me an idea of the, the level of experience in the room. And already, if, people, if I get a lot of people saying, oh, look, I've done none or, or less than zero to three, then I'm going to assume that the challenges for virtual are high, are strong. You know, there's a lot of challenges in this room. But more than 20, that might trigger a different interaction after this. So we're actually going to open this poll. So the poll will appear below the chat window. So let's open this poll. And if you guys could answer the question, how many virtual training sessions have you delivered in the last six months? Now, I'll give you a cheat. If you are not necessarily the facilitator, but you're just managing that from a learning perspective, I'm also okay for you to, to answer with that in mind. So go ahead. I'm going to leave the poll open for three seconds. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. I'm going to leave the poll open for one, one minute. So please go ahead and, and enter in your poll results. So right so now, those of, those of you writing in the chat, um, it's not in the chat. You should see a polling tab um, just below yeah. the chat. It should have popped up. But if it has not popped up for you, you may see um, an option to expand and the words polling. And yeah. in there, you can jump in and you can answer and you can submit. So and those if you're on an iPad, if you're on a mobile device, there's three buttons, three, three dots, like we bring up extra options and that will bring you to polling. Okay, so if you're on a mobile device or, a, or you're working on a smaller screen, polling will be hidden behind the three buttons um, the, the, the three to give you more options for interactions near uh, there. So, so let's close the poll in another 20 seconds. Yeah, so we've got some good um, questions, Ben, just while people are finishing out the, uh, sure. the poll. Um, so points like, uh, you know, sometimes closing the chat window. Um, as with any technology, there are so many different ways to, to interface with it, this technology to allow people to get on, whether they're on a a phone or whether they're on a desktop or a laptop or they're dialing in, that obviously there are different ways of, of interacting with it. And now for this, for this session that we're doing, um, obviously there's no opportunity to kind of pre-prep you guys before coming in. So we, we do our best and you know, when we look at it, we, we'll probably get 95% you know, of you able to, to do something like this, which when you're doing a town hall or a webinar or a webcast, that kind of makes sense and, and that's okay. So you, you kind of accept that as the, as the outcome. Now, if you're running a, a classroom session on something related to compliance or regulation, or maybe you're doing a leadership session or employee engagement, you're doing small groups. You might want to keep them down as low as 12 so you can really have one-on-one -on -one interactions. And when you're doing that and you're running this as a series, obviously what you want to do is first off the bat, spend the time with the group getting them used to the tools one by one, getting them comfortable, how they're logging in, you know, hey, you're logging on on your mobile, are you gonna be doing that for each session? So that they can really learn how to utilize all of the tools. So then when you jump in and you start talking about the really important classroom session that you're doing, everybody's already familiar. And that is the difference obviously between a 12 person um, classroom session on a very specific topic and a broadcast like we're doing. So okay. ben, I'll back to you for the results. I think yeah, so, time. so the results should now be shown. We've closed, we've closed that poll. The results should be shown. I recognize some people couldn't get their poll. There's a range of reasons that might be happening. But we've got 60% of people not delivering that much, 22% of people delivering a few. We've got a couple of people, 8%, eight, eight percent, six, 6 to 8%. Uh, we've got a bunch of people who are over 10 to 20 uh, virtual sessions. So that's fantastic, and I hope this is valuable for you. But remember, we're just running this as a little bit of a practice. This is why design is important. How can I use polls creatively to, to create an interaction every three to four minutes? Let's come back to our guiding principles, right? How can I use polls to 
create those interactions and to build that engagement, right? And, and, and I had one, a customer of mine, when I was running a training for them on how to deliver virtually, they said, oh, but why do we need to do this? I, I, and I said, the reality is you probably don't need to do it. It may not always even support the learning. You need to do it because you need to create the interactions. So some things you'll be doing because it really does help your learning message. Some things you might be doing it just to get people to pay attention every couple of minutes. And so that's that mindset you need to be bringing in from a design perspective because they need to be set up in advance. So if I come back to our, our, our list of different tools of the trade, I'm just gonna close my poll so I can see everyone's chat. Ah, so, so a couple of questions are coming in. I can see one here. Uh, there's a few questions coming in. Um, yeah, ben, do you want me to go through the questions now or do we want to save some of these? I mean, we have some directly related to polling. Yeah, to uh, polling. Some others that are, that, are, that are broader that I will bring back when we get to the Q&A section. Um, so one of the key questions was, uh, well, actually a statement from Patrick was that it's, um, it's good to have a host um, so that they could create an impromptu poll if, if there wasn't one pre-prepared. And I think you have, have some pointers around that, obviously pre-preparing being key. But yeah, that's one of our key components is hosting, yep. So obviously having a host to manage that is, is very good. Um, a question on can you do polling in Zoom? Yeah, so before we get to that question, I just want to go back. Would it be beneficial to ask participants to use a particular device? Yes. Actually, it would. If it's a company-driven initiative, I would highly encourage you guys to get people to log on to their PC um, or, or iPad. Just pick one device or one platform because the interface does vary and it's just an extra layer of complexity. So I would definitely suggest that is a good idea. Um, so, so let's go to that question about Zoom. We'll come to the trust question in a moment. So look at the Zoom process is a little bit different. This is the polls are made. You still need to get on 30 minutes early, you know, before every virtual session, both with WebEx and Zoom. And I can't remember if polling is available for all for 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 Not free all subscribers. Licenses. Yeah, so you yeah. would need you would need to have a, a paid license on Zoom to utilize polling. Uh, they may have some limited on, on the free version. It's been a while since I've used the free version, so I'm gonna apologize right. but, but I'm only familiar with the, the licensed version. Yeah, with polling, with polling though, the Zoom will throw you into their web browser, into your account, and you set up the polls in the account, um, and then that in this in in the web browser session, and then that will then upload into your Zoom session. So you don't do it within the same window. I know that much. Um, yeah, we so have got attendees it. confirming that um, Zoom polling is not available in the free version, and it's. Uh, is available in the licensed version. Yeah, we, yeah. we use the licensed version. So. so we've got a couple of questions that I want to try to address in, in kind of, you know, how do we create trust? How do we, um, uh, what are the guidelines for content development? You know, how do attendee sizes affect the shaping of the class? And I want to come back to, you know, these golden rules here. So, you know, the design answers all of those questions, you know, I, before I even pick up a pen or I pick the technology, I am determining, A, what do I need to achieve? This is step one. What, who are these learners? What do they need to know? And what should the business outcome be? If I can answer those questions first, then I would say, well, if I need to achieve that, what is the best way to make that happen, right? Can I achieve those things virtually? Can I achieve those things? WebEx is paid. Can I achieve these things in a classroom? Maybe I need a blend. So, you know, the primary... We're focusing on VLT because this is a stopgap measure. I can, I can get a virtual training going today, but in reality, best practice is a blend of solutions. So deploying a platform or hosting a, a learning journey, which has VLT elements, but there's another backbone releasing content, creating social interaction inside and outside of these virtual experiences. So our best practice is, is a more blended approach to learning. But if you just have to go with a VILT and you've got to get it done, then you know your design mantra is who are the learners? So within who are the learners, you'll be thinking where are they, internet connectivity, um, how much time do they really have? You know, For example, senior leaders, the executive team versus individual contributors, that's going to impact certain decisions that you'll make, um, the size of the population, you know, all of that will come in. No matter how big the size is, whether it's 15 people or 300 people, you're going to want to have an interaction every three to four minutes. So that affects your design, 
right? So if I know I have to have an, effect, an interaction every three to four minutes, and I know that I picked this technology and my tools of the trade are polls, chat, typing, dropping a pin on the screen, then, uh, then I'm going to be building those in. If I've chosen Zoom, not all of the interactions work the same way or aren't even available in Zoom as they are on WebEx. Um, so, so you need to know your technology in order to then inform your design. Right? So, so it's all interconnected. It's hard to answer these things separately. How do you build trust? Well, there might be skepticism. Right? I really want to hone in on that. So a big part of not just VILT, but launching digital technology, uh, digital modern digital learning, transforming your learning organization is about trust and change management. Because the reality is we work with a lot of banks, for example. And when we work with banks, often you know, the bank will say, we've never done this before. And I'll say, well, what is the current culture of digital the, and the current perception of digital, sorry, in the business? And they will say, oh, we do it because we have to. It's boring compliance training, and it's generally a negative perception. So you may need to build trust through a change management program. Maybe I have a session just to introduce them to the platform so, so, you, can, um, so you can start to build familiarity. Familiarity builds trust. Right? So that might be one area I build trust. Another thing might be have a communication coming from the leadership team throughout the organization to say, hey guys, in these difficult times, we've got to lean on virtual just as much as we would any other interaction. So treat it with as much respect as you would a classroom training or anything else. You know? So messages from the leadership team can be valuable. Um, but yeah, so trust is built through familiarity and through experience. So the next time, the second session will be better than the first session for one group of pop population. Um, so there's lots of ways you build trust, and it is something you build into the design. So when I've done the who is my audience question, one of the questions I'll ask myself is, what is their perception of virtual? What is their perception of digital? Um, so let's go into some other questions here. So Ben, I'm going to take a quick pause because I think there's a, a great question that kind of sums mm. up um, us dealing with questions um, from, from Betty Lai, which is uh, too many questions in chat, what to do? And um, you know, that, that's a good point when we're in a group as big as us. We're over 180 participants right now. And um, there are various different functions for doing Q&A. Uh, we keep it all in the chat when we're using a group that may be not familiar with the technology. There is also a separate Q&A function. When you're using a, uh, delivering to a group that's very familiar, you can use a Q&A function that is separate and have specific Q&A times. Here we're trying to keep rolling interactions, but you will notice that we keep telling you, guys, we're, we're paying attention to the chat. We just might not be picking out your question right now because we're focusing on what's relevant um, for the now. Yeah. And Oliver, can I add something? Another tool, uh, Betty, that you can deploy is that you can save the chat. So your host, one of the instructions I will give my hosts who are hosting the session is to save the polls and save the chat because there might be meaningful data and insights that we need and especially there might be follow-up items. So we could, so in GP, we will record a podcast that will answer some of the other questions that we didn't get to in an internal um, you know, session that we're running with our employees across the company globally. So, so save the chat will help you then capture the chat. If you don't save it, it's gone forever. So that's another tip. Is anything you don't get to, you can save it and you can set up another mechanism to respond to those other questions. And that's um, in most, um, most um, online training tools. Uh, yeah, I can't speak for all add, of them. Yeah. We're getting a lot of questions that are very specific to different types of training tools and we are very happy to answer them but we will not be answering them during this session. We're not going to go into the technical details of WebEx versus Zoom yeah. versus Teams in, in this session um, so much. But yes, we, we will be preparing answers to those questions. We will have this copy of chat and we'll run a Q&A, um, a written Q&A that goes with this where we answer those kind of questions. So those specific, uh, we can certainly um, yeah. uh, do that. Yeah. To be honest, I mean, there's, yeah, there's tools for, for, for doing all sorts of things you can plug in or run alongside, you know, whatever platform you're choosing to deliver your virtual training. There's a couple of other ones. Tips for small group discussion. So here we're talking about virtual breakouts. So we're not going to run a virtual breakout today. They are more complex to run and not all platforms support virtual breakouts. Um, but virtual breakouts are a really powerful tool because that's where you can take a large group and then you can get the group to interact. I guess I come up with two or three really key rules for virtual breakouts. Have your pens ready. Number one, if you're going to run virtual breakouts, 
make sure you've got a sub facilitator to go into each breakout room. So if I have 100 participants, maybe I want to do breakouts of 20. That means I need five total people who can run those breakouts. It's not essential, but it does really help keep people on track. I mean, you've seen in a training room, even in a live face-to-face -face training room, there's always one table who doesn't participate or, you know, it doesn't really do it. And I don't know why that is. But, but so one is facilitators for each breakout group in, in an ideal state. Number two, you probably want to have more hosts. So what the hosts will do during a breakout is they will jump in and out of the breakouts, boom, 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 to make sure that, you know, are there any technical issues? Is everything going okay? Um, you know, so that would be another tip that I would have. Um, and then the final tip that I would give for, for, for virtual breakouts is that you, you should be timing them and giving warnings. So tell everyone how long they'll be in a virtual breakout for. If the platform, so WebEx, for example, supports the ability for you to send warnings, the breakout will be closing in two minutes, the breakout will be closing in one minute. So, so there's lots of different things you can do for that. Um, so, so there's probably some tips and guidelines. Just, I mean, there's a lot more nuance to it, such as preparing your facilitators, having content that each facilitator might be able to share using the whiteboard. Um, within each breakout to kind of capture discussions. So, so yes, there's some tips for small group discussions. Uh, what else have we got here? I think that there's probably another good question here around tech. So, you know, no, it's just how many, how about the technical training, right? Yeah. So it's, that's a really interesting question and this won't be relevant for everybody here, but I will address it because it's a good case study in Courses for courses, different types of learning outcomes dictate or determine different types of, um, of technologies. So we do do technical training and product training virtually for some of our customers, especially in the automotive space. Sometimes we can do things via WebEx. So we've built uh, for, like, so for training automotive staff in how to perform maintenance on vehicles, which we do do virtually. Um, and we've been doing it for a long time, actually. There's better technology now, but we've created virtual uh, interfaces of uh, virtual uh, of the dashboard, for example, of a vehicle or of the engine that we will share and we can run that in WebEx or on a bespoke uh, training platform. We'll come to VR later because VR and virtual training and connecting people socially has some challenges. But, but, and then we can have everyone on there. The facilitator is kind of guiding and demonstrating, but there are limitations. You might then need to stagger that out. So we'll run a virtual session to give you the knowledge. Then you might need to have people on site to go and do the practice. Now, COVID-19, of course, has another big impact. So, um, so, so there are ways to do it, but you've got to be very careful. What am I realistically going to achieve? Don't think you're going to be able to train someone full technical just virtually when there are hands-on components to it. You know, so be realistic. You know, there's nothing more frustrating for me than having a customer saying, we need to achieve all of this, but except you only have this many tools to do it with. And, and, it's, and it's really hard to, uh, to, to promise things, to, you know, to work within those constraints. So be realistic about what's achievable. Um, some more questions are coming in. Um, don't worry, for those of you who've missed part of it, we've recorded the session and we will be sending out a recording. Paul Lim has said, how not to get engaged with one participant and lose the rest. Um, so, you know, so number one, we mute participants. Um, so we can try to make sure that not one participant is always speaking up. But so far, look, we've covered about 15 different questions from different people. I think muting people is a great way. Using people's names and unmuting them, you control the unmuting, is another great way to make sure that you're, you're capturing people. Um, ben, is it fair to say that, I mean, it, it really also does depend. And again, it, it comes back to that core of design, whether we're doing classroom or we're doing virtual or, or we're doing job, job aids even, where it's understanding your, your learners and understanding your outcomes. And obviously, Yes, there's always a risk, even if you're just doing a classroom session, that one vocal member of the class dominates. And of course, um, it's the same in virtual. And you've really got to look at what's my, my class size, what are my, my outcomes, who are my audience, what am I trying to achieve, um, and, and then really work around that. And you will always have a vocal minority, especially in a group of 180 people like we have. We're going to have about 20 to 30 people that are really involved in the chat and a few that are, are maybe uh, not engaging quite as much. 
And, and that's going to happen. And there are ways to encourage engagement through different interactions. So not everything has to be typed in chat. You, especially smaller groups, you can use more audio, more, more voice, you can get them involved speaking. And you can also get them involved through interactions like polling, dropping pins, annotating, um, typing on the screen, those kind of interactions. So someone said, how do I find more than one participant in the chat? The, the, the chat is a flowing thing. It's just going to keep on scrolling. Um, so you really need to find the participants not in the chat, but in the participant window. And then you can actually, depending on how we've set it up, you can actually select individual people, individual participants to write a chat to in the, in the I'll just bring it up so you can see we, it. We don't have that. Um, yeah, we, I know we've disabled right. it, but, but yeah. in a smaller session or depending on how you've got it set up, in this section here that I'm about to highlight, you can actually select people and you can, and you can you know, send one-on-one -on -one chats, you know, things like that. Um, VR and AR questions, I'm not going to really go into too much detail with that because you can always just run a virtual session but then have people at key moments put on a set of VR goggles and, and start to do things. Of course, augmented reality becomes complicated when everyone's at home in that, you know, you'd need a mobile device probably for the AR uh, or, or, or a VR headset. You know, so I won't go into the VR AR blend, but as is possible, um, it just means a blend of technologies. Um, we have a question here, Ben, um, that we're, I, I'm, I'm going to highlight because I quite like it, um, from Robert, that we're working as a presenting team very efficiently. How are you communicating so that you don't talk over each other? So there are a bunch of options for doing and that. And Oliver, I just, no, I'm just kidding. I was just pretending to talk over you. Go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. That's why I thought. <laughs> so, so Ben and I, it's actually just a telepathic link that we have. We have a microchip in each of our brains. But um, seriously, we work together a huge amount and have done over the past decade, which yeah. is why it may seem a bit seamless. We're actually not using any more tools than is available in WebEx. We will occasionally message each other privately in the WebEx. Uh, but, of course, there are other yeah. things that you can do if you're the not... The key good. part is planning. You know, it's planning and design. So I cannot stress enough the importance of design. Once you've got the design down and you know what interactions you're going to use, when are you going to use them, you can then assign roles. So Oliver, you're going to run this section. I'm going to run this session. Uh, Oliver, can you please monitor the chat for me? You know, and so, and so you assign those roles and then that helps you with that. But if, if I was just to run this and Oliver had never seen this before, or my hosts had never seen this before, I promise you it would not be very smooth. So the answer is design preparation. You know, good design and then of course preparation and briefings internally is, is, is key for that smoothness. Now Ben, I'm gonna interrupt you for a moment. Um, as we are going through this, we have six minutes left. Um, as you guys have probably noticed, we have transitioned seamlessly and organically into Q&A here. And we just keep working through these questions. Now, keep putting them in the chat, even if we don't have time, because we are going to be respectful of your time, and this session is ending in six minutes. What we will be doing is we will record this chat, and as part of the, um, the recording that we send out, we will include um, answers to the Q&As in there that we don't get time to deal with now. So you will be heard, your voice will be heard, we will be responding. And as we are, um, as we are doing this, of course, we did offer that opportunity for a, a quick 30-minute um, consultation with you guys. So you can reach out to myself. I will be sending you guys a message uh, with the recording and the, and the answers to the Q&A. And we will be able to go into a little bit more detail on, you know, if you have specific questions, hey guys, we've invested in Microsoft Teams, we didn't realize we could use it for virtual classroom, we really want to get going with this, we can kind of help you with some first steps around that. So, so that's so, something that we offer for you guys. So uh, Oliver, I just want to kind of make sure that we're using this last couple of minutes. I, I'm seeing questions about which, which headset I'm using. I will try to maybe send an email with that information. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. But there is one I other story. Everybody knows that yeah. I'm, I'm using a headset that is, um, you know, I think it was 15 Singapore dollars from a 7-Eleven. So, <laughs> so and I had to get a story, yeah. Oliver, that I want to share with everybody just before we kind of wrap up, you know, and I think it's important because virtual is great, but I really want people to see the big picture of digital learning. So how can you run learning that's more effective than classroom, um, you know, but exclusively remotely, right, exclusively virtually with no classroom. So I'm just going to quickly show you a screenshot and I'm going to share my screen. Um, 
one second. And then I'm just going to show you an example of something that's a more complete experience. So, and this is really to give you some food for thought, everybody. So here it comes here. All right, can everybody see this slide here? It's called Leading People. Getting yeses from the chat box then. So look, this is an experience that we've de developed. It's one of a series of experiences for a specific client. And it's for frontline managers. And it's actually a frontline manager training, you know, dealing with things like real skills, delegation, coaching, giving feedback, leadership mindset, transitioning from individual contributor to manager. You know, and so could we do all of that just virtually? I would say no. I think that would be too complicated. Can it be done in the COVID-19 world remotely? Yes, because, but you have to then start to think about digital ecosystems. So we use a platform called Intrepid. So we are kind of platform agnostic. We go with what works. And so what Intrepid will do is it will release content week by week in a platform. And within that platform, it's, that's really the backbone of the experience. So that's my central location. Um, you will be able to you know, go in and have poll. There will be little polls and it's all tiles. And so I can watch a video, I can read a content, I can participate in a, an assessment, I can um, dis have discussions and ask questions and hear from experts all week by week, maybe one or two hours of total activity per week. And then what we do is we support the weekly release of content, which is a social learning experience, a micro social learning experience with RC expert sessions, which are the virtual sessions. So we came in and we strategically said, what's the best use of virtual? Oh, actually, we didn't say that. We said, do we need virtual? And we realized that these participants, as they move through and try to take action, they might want support to actually go and um, to go and and ask questions of an expert, ask questions of each other. So we created these. 90 minute kind of forums where people can log in and ask questions and get support you know throughout and so for us in this specific experience with this particular audience with this particular business need you know we decided on this blend of technology right so this is a fully fledged leadership training experience delivered over eight to nine weeks with virtual, but also another backbone of content release and content delivery so they can weave it into their job. So for me, for us, this is best practice. This is where you really want to go. So the question that I have for you, why did I share this story? I don't expect you to run this exactly, but when you're asking yourself the question, be creative, right? Is it, does it just have to be virtual? Can I have an email that goes out or a video that people watch beforehand and then I come to the virtual and then I go back to work and do something else? Or do you want to take it to the next level and use a platform like Intrepid or Degreed or, um, or Zunos or some of these other really amazing kind of learning platforms out there to help create a more complete learning experience? And I tell you, when you launch something like this, this changes your learning culture. You know, this builds learners that are more accountable for their learning. Um, you know, but often we're starting from a position where learners are not accountable. So, so I want to share that story quickly to kind of talk about virtual integrated into a wider experience. So look, in the last minute, let me summarize some key points for everybody just to, just to refresh. Um, seeing a lot of really good feedback. I'm very happy about that. So let's remind those key tools. Less time, 90 minutes max, 60 minutes ideal. You've got to totally rethink your content. Do not just take classroom and slap it into virtual environment because it's not going to work. Too many distractions exist, so you have to interact with everybody three to four minutes, and that absolutely influences your design. How are you going to interact with people? Well, that's determined by your group size and what technology you use. And a golden rule for design, a golden rule for design and delivery is asking yourself, how can I ask instead of tell? That's the, probably the primary thing. These are the tools that we have today because we're using WebEx. You may have different tools. So let your tools determine how you interact. Um, so look, I hope this was helpful for everyone. We're going to run more sessions like this about we're going to run sessions around how do you engage people on larger social learning experiences? How do you keep them coming back? Um, how do you uh, uh, design and deliver things virtual? How do you actually go through the design process in detail? We're going to do all sorts of experiences. So keep an eye out. Um, this is regular thing from us, so thank you so much.
And so guys, just before, just before Ben wraps up and just to end this session, so two quick things. A lot of questions on, um, you know, can I get the recording? Yes, absolutely you can. We will be sending this out to you, um, to your, the email address that you registered. Uh, number two, are there more sessions like this? I'd like my colleagues to, um, to, to join one. Um, this session, you will have access to the recording. They can see that. But this is, um, we're, we're moving on with this series. So our series is on thriving, not just surviving. So our focus has been that digital has been something that we have been focused on um, long before COVID-19 made it um, a business imperative for everyone. We've believed that it can add something to the, the, the learning tool set that, um, that we have in our organizations. So the next event is scheduled for the 24th of June. We'll be talking about unlocking the value in digital learning. So focusing not just on the knee jerk reaction that some organizations are doing right now, just to try and move things wholesale onto digital, but um, looking at how can you actually get more sustainable value out of digital learning. So it's not just for lockdown. So everybody that is on the 24th of June. And the last thing I'm going to drop in the chat box is we have a set of free resources um, for the COVID-19 situation, ranging from how to lead virtually, how to learn virtually, how to live virtually. And um, I will drop that right now into the chat box. Um, you will see that link um, at the end of my emails that I send you, you'll have access to that. So apologies for taking you guys two minutes over. I know I promised I wouldn't at the beginning, but I want to thank everybody for their attendance. We will be passing out the recording and um, answers to those questions that we didn't quite get to uh, yep. this session. Thank you, everyone. Good luck, and I really hope you can build better virtual sessions now. Thanks, everybody. Have a great, also, great day. I also want to thank our hosting team that you guys oh, have yes, of course. from today. They are in the background. They are what make this possible. A lot of compliments to Ben and I for being interactive and doing this. We can only do that because we have people behind the scenes handling those audio requests, those, those challenges, those technical problems, uploading polls, making sure the technology is working. It, it takes a team to do this. And so, you know, we have people that say, oh, I'm trying to run this session. I can't get it to go smoothly. You can get your team helping you to do that. And it makes all the difference. So everybody, once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben, for sharing your expertise. And I'm looking forward to connecting with each of you individually after this session to see how we can help you in these really difficult times. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much.